It's good to see everybody. Everyone survived the storm, it looks like. I mean, obviously you're here, so. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll, um, we'll get into the lesson. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day that you gave us. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together as a group of believers. Lord, to look at your word. Lord, to look at different um, issues that affect our lives and the lives of our children. We pray, God, that uh, you would guide and direct us this, this morning. I pray, Lord, that um, our hearts would be open to you, your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is where we were last week, if you remember. And uh, last week we talked about part number one. If you weren't here, I can get you notes on it. But part number one was, we're talking about how to help the youth in our church. Um, we talked about some statistics that 70% of teenagers, when they get to 18 to 22 years old, leave the church. And only about 50% of them actually ever come back. So we talked about the issues that, that our young people face. We talked about... Um, in that statistic, 11% of those actually completely lose their faith in Christianity. Um, and only three out of 10 stay involved in church. So we talked about different contributing factors. I want to talk about, we have a lot to go over today. So I want to talk about some practical things that we can do as a church, as parents, as mentors to help our teenagers or not just our teenagers, but again, um, our young people. And I would, I would classify this really from third grade on up. So uh, we read Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9, and we'll read it again this morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Remember last week we talked about the fact that that word might actually would mean with everything that you have. There, the Hebrew word there would translate to, like, with, with all your very. Um, so with everything that you have. <clears throat> and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently um, to thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. We talked about one of the, one of the biggest things that we need to do as, as a church and as parents is to help our teenagers and our young people to establish their own love for the Lord, to establish their own real personal faith with Jesus Christ that is theirs and not just their parents or their churches. So as we look at this and we go into part two, what is our job? What is our goal? What is our duty as parents and as a church, as leaders, as mentors? Well, I, I, I would sum it up with this. Our goal is to prepare young people to go out into the darkened, fallen world and live a godly life. That's our, that's our ultimate goal, to prepare the young people in our church, in our families, to be able to go out and live a godly life in our fallen, sinful world. So with this in mind, it's imperative that we make the development of internalized convictions one of our primary goals. We're going to talk about establishing internalized convictions. What do I mean by, inter well, first of all, what do I mean by convictions? Anybody have an idea? Terry? Sticking to something would be one way to, to talk about it, one way to describe it. Um, a conviction, a conviction includes what we believe, why we believe it, and how committed we are to keeping it. What we believe, why we believe it, and how committed we are to keeping it. We need to cultivate biblical convictions in the hearts of the young people of our church, in the hearts of our children. We need to cultivate biblical convictions. When, when, our, when our children are small, right, like Eli, He's three years old. Um, and Alina, she's even younger. She's one. And she's not quite there yet. But, but Eli, I don't need to give him a reason for every command that I give him. He may ask why all the time. But I don't need to give him a reason for every command that I give him. He needs to learn 
to obey, to do what he's told right away. And, you know, we're still working on that with Emmy and Maddie as well. But now, as Maddie gets older, Maddie's turning eight in a month or two, June. I know his birthday. I just don't know what month we're in. <laughs> Maddie's turning eight pretty soon. And he's at an age now, and he's even coming even more on that age, where we're starting, and really Emmy too, like, it blows my mind. She's five, almost six, but it's like, she's asking, like, she's sharp, she's quick. <clears throat> she definitely takes, that, takes after her mother. But we're, um, hold off on the agreements back there. We're, uh, we're having to start to explain to them more so the why behind the commands, right? And when they do something that's wrong, we explain to them why it was sinful and why they shouldn't do that and, and things that they can do to not do that in the future. We seem to have that conversation quite a bit these days. In the same book that I referenced last week, Shepherding a Child's Heart, the author says this, a heart, and this is what we're looking to, 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 um, to accomplish with biblical convictions in our children, a heart that is committed to doing God's will regardless of the consequences. Can we think of anybody in the Bible, in the Old Testament even, who had some convictions that they were committed to doing God's will regardless of the consequences? I think of, I think of four boys that stand out immediately. Someone want to give me their names? And Daniel. Typically, it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. These were a perfect, a perfect example of four boys who, you know, in fact, Daniel says, and he's just a young boy when he's, when he's taken from his home and stands before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, the Bible tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart. He had a conviction. He knew what he believed, why he believed it, and was committed to keeping it. In his book, Growing Up Christian, Carl Graustein says, It matters greatly what we believe. It isn't enough to just attend church regularly or be around people who have biblical values. Our attitudes and behaviors flow from our beliefs and our values, and not from the beliefs and values of those around us. Therefore, our hearts need to be shaped by the word of God. We need biblical convictions. Many of you who have children in this room either homeschool your kids or send your kids to a Christian school, okay? Many of you do, not all of you. It's not just enough to send your kids to a Christian school to send them to youth group and expect them to turn out fine. It's not enough. I can give you names of, I'm not going to, but I can give you names of people that sat next to me in class in my Christian school and came to youth group every week and was in every church service who don't walk with the Lord at all. It's not enough. If you're a parent this morning, you as a parent need to take the initiative in your child's life to start to develop godly biblical convictions in your children's life. And it has to go beyond your preferences. Like, like it's okay to have preferences. That's, that's okay. I'm not saying you can't have preferences. But you have to explain to your child the reason behind your preference. You, know, you understand what I mean? A preference is something that's not necessarily, like, it's not necessarily like um, a command in scripture, but I prefer to do it this way. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally fine. Each person has, we believe, an individual soul liberty to make that decision, right? To have their preferences. But it's not just enough because your children are not going to share the same preferences as you as they get older. They're not going to. I'll take one, one example. Um, and this is like, and I'm not even talking about in, in, in the church. I'm talking about in personal life. My dad has very different music preferences than I do. He does. He likes like the old like, and I don't not like this, but a lot of times he likes to listen to like the old like country style, like, and, and even like, he likes to listen to like the old country style Christian music. And I just find it cringy, honestly. And I've told him that. But that's okay, because it's a preference. Adam has completely different... And I find some of your music is cringy as well. And I'm about to say that. Adam has some completely different music preferences than I do. And I'm not talking about... Because there's, there's, there's three 
This is a completely different subject. But there's three characteristics of music, right? There's Christian music, there's non-Christian music, and there's anti-Christian music, right? Like, like we won't get into that because it's a different, a different lesson for a different time, right? Like, um, anyway, like, like, you can listen to your Disney soundtrack. That's fine, okay? But um, Adam has completely different music preferences than I do, and he finds some of my preferences cringy. He lets me know on a daily basis. If I send him a song, yeah, I, I just kind of stop now. But no, you didn't hurt my feelings. When Adam helped me paint the porch, he got a half hour of his music. I think I got two hours. No, that's because I have my air pop So listen, so listen, so listen. We have to give biblical reasons for our convictions to our children. Um, we, we talked about this, but parents often correct their children from preference and church culture rather than God's word. Again, it's okay to have preference. I'm not saying that it's not okay. I'm not saying that that's wrong. Everybody has their own preferences. But if you're going to establish biblical convictions, because your child is going to create their own preferences, and ultimately there has to be some biblical conviction that is based on that. Right? So we need to establish those biblical convictions, and they come from God's word. And honestly... This may be shocking, but the youth ministry is where you see the fruit of that kind of instruction. Whether we do what we do because we do it, or we do what we do because we believe this is what the Bible teaches. The fruit of the kind of instruction is often moralism in exasperated teenagers. Remember, we're not looking for behavior modification, we're looking for heart change. I mentioned already, but a conviction includes what we believe, why we believe it, and how committed we are to keeping it. We have to help them to discern the difference between their subject, uh, subjective sense and the objective truth of God's word. Does anybody know what the difference between subjective and objective is? You want me to tell you? I was hoping somebody would tell me. So objective is unbiased, impartial, and it's like an unmovable opinion, okay? The Word of God is objective. It's unbiased, it's impartial, and it's not moving. Subjective is the opposite of objective. Uh, it's subject to your own personal opinion or bias, okay? Now, if your children go to public school or just are involved in our culture in any way, subjective sense is pushed very hard. Well, how do you feel? How have your experiences brought you to that decision? And we know, we, as Bible-believing Christians, we know that there's a massive problem with that. So the process of cultivating biblical convictions begins with an assessment of a child's spiritual condition. And we'll talk about that as we talk about uh, a child's relationship with God. So how can we then also cultivate a heart of wisdom? Because that's important too. Biblical convictions and wisdom, they go hand in hand. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom. We'll, at the end of this period, we'll, we'll, talk about, uh, we'll be in Proverbs. But, so you can actually turn there now to Proverbs chapter 1. But we have to help our young people understand the importance of wisdom and how they're to acquire it. How many of you wish, as a teenager and a young adult, you had more wisdom? I mean, yeah, all of us should be raising our hand. Sometimes today we think, I wish I had more wisdom. We don't make good choices on our own, do we? From the beginning of time, we haven't made good choices. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the list goes on and on and on. We don't make good choices on our own. And then to top it off, God's laws don't cover everything in the daily experience of life. They don't. They don't tell us where we should live. They don't tell us how to bargain for a fair price. God's laws don't cover those things. They're like a fence, though, that surrounds this, this, this pasture. 
And the pasture is, it's a fertile pasture, and it's given to us to, to keep us within the boundaries of his blessing. Wisdom covers all the experiences of life that fall within the boundaries of, of the law. And that leads us to a fruitful life and protects us from ultimately violating God's commands through foolishness. Wisdom covers things like how to form friendship, with whom to form friendships, how to earn money, how to use money, how to bargain for a fair price, how to evaluate a potential spouse. Now, there are some guidelines in Scripture. Obviously, it's not like do this, this, and this, and you'll find a good, a good spouse. But there are things that talk about you know, not being une unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But all there's other things that we have to put together through wisdom. Wisdom teaches us how to live in a community with others, how to speak, how to recognize wicked people who look appealing, how to listen, how to negotiate conflict, how to treat those that are less fortunate than you, and especially wisdom instructs us how to get wisdom. Wisdom instructs us on how to get more wisdom. Proverbs talks about that too. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and doesn't upbraid or chide or, or uh, tell you off for asking for wisdom. Three, there are three simple questions we can ask when, when, when trying to teach a child uh, to look for wisdom or, or to gain wisdom. First, does this please God? Will this decision cause somebody to stumble? Is this decision or activity putting the first and second great commandments in their proper place in my life? What are those, the first and second great commandments? Jesus said, the first commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So let's look at a, a few principles for pursuing wisdom and convictions. In Proverbs 1.5, we see um, there's the priority of wisdom and humility. A, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. It takes humility to seek counsel, doesn't it? It takes humility to, to ask somebody's advice for something. It shows us that, well, we don't know the answer and we need help getting the answer. A lot of people make decisions without counsel, and shortly after, they're regretting their decision or they're backtracking. The Bible also tells us that there's safety in a multitude of counselors. In Proverbs 1.7, we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, a relationship with God. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, a relationship with parents. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Verse number 10, godly peers. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And then Proverbs 12, 15 Humility, again, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So we've seen our duty, our job is to help cultivate biblical convictions and a heart of wisdom. And then we're going to spend the rest of our time today talking about a teen or a child's relationship with God. Because ultimately... If a child or a teenager is going to continue making good biblical decisions and living for the Lord and not walking away, they're going to need to have their own personal, deep, real relationship with God. Two questions that we're going to ask. The importance of the question is, first of all, is the child saved? Has the child been converted? And then the second one is, how important is their relationship with the Lord? So we'll talk, we'll talk about conversion quickly. We, we understand that conversion is the most important aspect, right? And without any of this, without conversion, your child stands no chance. Romans 1.16 reminds us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. We understand the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, paying the eternal payment for our sin. But your child has to, or any child, has to put their faith and have their own belief in the gospel. There's the gospel call, right? The message of the gospel that's proclaimed to sinners. Romans 3.23 all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 reminds us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8, But God commendeth, or he displayed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel call is the verbal message of the gospel proclaimed to sinners. It also includes the invitation to, for each individual to respond personally in repentance and faith. And it's the promise of forgiveness and eternal life. There's the gospel, there's the gospel call, but then there's a response that's needed. The response is twofold. I mean, it's... I'll explain that. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Well, what do I mean by repentance? Well... What does the word repent mean? Well, unlike the Catholics who believe you can sin and confess, it means you can sin and not do it again. Well, the word repent actually literally means to turn around, to change one's mind. Because as, as believers, we still sin. And even we're told that in, uh, in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But we don't confess to somebody else. We confess, I don't, I'm sorry, Steve, I don't have that, that verse up there. Um, we, don't conf, we don't have to confess to a priest. We confess our sins directly to Jesus. But biblical repentance is literally to change your mind or to change direction. It's sorrow for sin. It's changing your mind about sin. And it's turning from sin. And particularly for an unbeliever, it's turning from the sin of unbelief. We have to turn from the sin of unbelief before we can believe. And that's where faith comes in. Trusting in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus alone for salvation. So, as we start to think about a, teen, a child's relationship with God, whether it's a teen or, or a younger child, have they made a personal a personal faith. Have they put their faith and trust in Jesus? Have they made a legitimate profession of faith? True biblical convictions begin with genuine conversion. Our duty is to call young people to respond to the gospel and then teach them how to live in the good of it. Now, there are some cautions and questions about a child's conversion. I read a book... Um, in college, and it's the book, it's a really good book, it's small. The book is called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. And you're like, what? That's like a, a, a that's, a, that's this, um, you know, it, as Christians, we have church language, right? We say things like, and we actually, we don't really say that, that phrase here. Um, but we've said, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Well, that's not found anywhere in the Bible. That's not a biblical term. That's something that we've come up with. Because we understand that when someone puts their faith in Jesus, they're saying that, Jesus, I trust you as my Savior, and I'm giving you the authority to be the Lord over my life. But it can be confusing for a child. If you say, hey, if you ask Jesus into your heart, it can be confusing for a child. So basically, the premise was, you know, stop using that language. We're, we're still pushing conviction. We're still pushing the gospel. But we're, just, we're not, we're not going to use that language saying, ask Jesus into your heart. Have you put your faith in Jesus, in what he did on the cross, paying for your sin? See, it's different, right? It's a call to action. But do I treat a child like a believer that's in need of sanctification? Or like a sinner that's in need of a savior? Because there's two different things. If the child is a believer, we need to treat them like a sinner that's in need of sanctification. 
Because, remember, we have our children and they're growing up, and, and even if they're not our personal children, but they're children here in the church, they're growing up and they mess up. They make mistakes. They sin, right? Right? Yes? But, but we, as, as, as believers who have been saved, many of us for many years, we still mess up and still make mistakes and still sin, right? And God doesn't come down on us with a hammer and, and, and just crush us. Now, there is a, there's a place for correction and chastisement. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he, he corrects and disciplines. Every, he says, scourgeth every son who he delights in. So we understand that there's punishment and there are consequences. However, the goal is sanctification. The goal is growing in faith so we don't commit the same sin, as Vlad said, over and over and over again. Or are we dealing with an unconverted child? Someone who's never put their faith in Jesus. There's a warning, though, when we talk about this that's coming up that we need to keep in mind. First caution one, this warning, don't use the question of conversion to manipulate a child's behavior. What do I mean? I can't believe you did that. Someone who's a child of God would never act that way. That's a, an example of manipulating, using conversion to manipulate. Now, what does that do in a child's life who may actually truly be converted? It plants seeds of doubt. Children who grow up in churches often struggle. Even if they, put, even if they truly were converted at a young age, they often struggle, did I really mean what I believed when I, believe, when I said I believed it? Did I mean what I said when I prayed to God to save me? And when we th say things like, and I'm not accusing anybody in here of doing this, but when we say things to children like a child of God would never act that way, or someone who's a believer would never do that, well, God could look at you and say, I can't believe you did that. My child would never do that. That's not how God works with us, is it? We see the heart of God is that he is gentle and lowly. He's meek. We need to be meek with, with, with the young people in our church or our own children. Caution number two, don't evaluate on the basis of one episode of sin. Okay, say your, your child gets caught or a child gets caught doing something bad. Don't evaluate, because we're, we're called to be fruit inspectors, right? We'll read that later on, but Jesus says, by your, by, by your fruit shall all men know that you're my disciples. So we're called to be fruit inspectors. But don't look at one instance or one episode of sin and start to wonder, oh man, I bet this kid's not even saved. Instead, look at... Look at... Um, their responses to sin over time. Is there sorrow? Is there remorse over time? Because we all mess up. We all mess up. Even if we've been saved for 30 or 40 years, we still make mistakes. We still mess up. And faith isn't based on our work. Our, our, our salvation is not based on our works. We know that. And this, this process of sanctification literally takes our entire life. We can easily encourage false assurance in a child. I've heard parents say, say this about a child before. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're saved. They, they, they prayed when they were, they, they accepted Jesus when they were a young child. And the kid may not even remember or realize that. Don't, don't encourage false assurance, but definitely encourage genuine assurance. Go to 1 John 5, 13. It's going to be on the screen. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. How do you help a child who's struggling with, with whether or not th their conversion, their, their faith was real? Does anybody know? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ask them if their faith is real right now. If their faith is real right now, it doesn't matter if they believed every word they said when they were a child. 
Do you believe the gospel right now? Don't get caught up on, on, you know, you said a prayer when you were four or five years old. That was something I struggled with. And it was, I, I made a profession of faith when I was like four or five years old. I don't remember, like, I remember where I was. Like, you know, but I, you've, you've, you've all heard the preacher that comes in and says, if you can't remember the day, the time, what you were wearing, what the weather was, what song was being sung, if the list goes on and on, then you're not saved. That's not what, that's not true. If you believe the gospel today, then you're saved. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins in your stead, in your place today and paid your penalty and that he rose from the dead. If you believe that today, then you're saved. It doesn't matter what you said 50 years ago. Okay, but now if I go over... <laughs> It was important to know the van had a TV at the time. So I realized that he didn't quite get it. I don't believe that was my conversion. <laughs> I don't believe that. But it was a conversion van. That's true. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. That took up two minutes. So I have two minutes to go over now. <laughs> A good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. Verse 44, every tree is known by his own fruit. Despite the challenges that are involved in discerning whether a conversion has occurred or not, God does call us to be fruit inspectors. Genuine conversion should be visibly evident through good fruit. Now, sometimes I have apple trees. Not sometimes I have apple trees. I always have apple trees. But sometimes, so my apples produce, my trees produce pretty good apples. Um, I have one tree that produces really big red apples. They're called Wolf River apples. It's like this ancient variety. Um, I have this other tree across the street that produces a, a, a yellow transparent, which is more of a sweet apple. I planted four apple trees this year. I don't know. I don't remember what kind of apples they produce. Um, and then I have another tree that I don't know what kind of apple it produces either. But they, you mix them all together and you make some apple cider and it's delicious. Now they're good trees. Every now and then I get a bad apple on, on the good tree. Does that mean that the tree is bad because there's one evidence of bad fruit? No. Jesus talks about purging, right? And removing the sin from our life. We have to do that with our children. With the children that we are mentoring here in the church. We have to help them to understand that, yes, ultimately it's God and the Holy Spirit's work, and I've got to keep going because I'm not even halfway through. There are some biblical categories to exam examine. First is... Is there obedience to God's commands? 1 John 2, 3. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 3, 10. Loving others. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Another one. Sound doctrine. 1 John 4, 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. 1 John 5, 2, loving God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. You see that some of these are actually intertwined. So be on the lookout for bad fruit, right? If, we're, it's our, if our child is converted, be on the lookout for bad fruit to help prune and to direct. And to, and if I just left my trees alone and never pruned them, then eventually they would be good for nothing. The, the, the apples would be really little and sour and just not good. I mean, you could still use them. My dad has trees like that that he uses for apple cider. And there is a big difference between his apple cider and my apple cider when you drink it. You have to chew his. 
and uh, mine is a little more smooth to drink. There are patterns of deception that we can look out for. Are they continually being found out in sin? Significant disrespect towards parents or, over author or other authorities. A love for things of the world. If these are consistent patterns in your child's life or a child's life, there's a chance that your child's not a believer. Truly was never converted. Next, if a child claims to be a Christian, help them to understand and develop their relationship with God. Help them to understand and develop their own relationship with God. Make sure they understand the gospel from God's word. Can they describe the truth of the gospel from God's word directly? What do they believe about God? What do they believe about their sin and their status before God? What scriptures do they turn to and why? You have to help them root their relationship with God in his word. Do they have a grasp of the gospel in a way that can, it can function in their daily lives? Do they have a personal and real relationship with God? Maybe you have to ask yourself these questions to yourself before you can ask them to your children. Make sure their relationship with God functions in their daily lives. In the same book, uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart, the author says, internalization of the gospel is the process of your children embracing the things of God as their own living faith. Your wish during this period is to see your children develop autonomous identities as persons under God. Your child is either going to develop their identity as a child of God, or they're going to look to the world to develop their identity. And we know what happens when they do that. Our job is to point them to the word of God. Internalizing the gospel requires God's holy, uh, the Holy Spirit's work. But God honors means. And you have to instruct your teens in how to trust in the power of the gospel and cultivate the means that God gives to grow in their relationship to God. There's an importance of spiritual disciplines. Help a child to know and study God's word. Challenge them and encourage them to have a Bible reading plan. I've done this with the teens this year in youth group where uh, some of us are still on track. Others are behind. It's not a huge deal. I don't care if they're behind. I just care that they're doing it consistently. What we're doing with the teenagers is I, I'm personally reading through the whole Bible in a year. I've done that several times. And there's on version, which is the Bible app, there's, um, there are different reading plans. And so we're doing this reading plan together. It uses the Gospel Project. So it gives different videos explaining um, passages or explaining um, different books of the Bible and different ways that the Bible was written, whether poetry or historical or, or a narrative. I'm encouraging with your teenagers consistent Bible reading. You got to do that too. Do it with your children. We, we started that with Emmy and Maddie. Every day they have their devotions that they do. Every night, well, not as consistently as we need to, but we, read, we do family devotions. We read a Bible story together. Help them to understand and practice prayer. You know, many young people don't know how to pray. They don't know how to pray. They need to be taught. Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Talking through an issue of sin, we're not going to get... This is like the most practical part of this. Um, this is like the most practical part. And we don't have time to go over it. So, I have just been told by... Pastor, that we will do this next week, because this is probably an entire time <laughs> in and of itself. So come back next week if you want to hear part number three. But basically next week, we're going to talk about how to deal with specific instances of sin that come up. And you're probably thinking, well, Aaron, you don't have teenagers. 
your, your, chi your children are little, what experience do you have? I don't have a lot of experience, but I have biblical principles. I did have, uh, many of you remember, we had a foster son who was a teenager with many issues for a year. So I do have a little bit of experience, maybe not as much as some of you, but the biblical truths are there and we can glean from them, right? So let's have a word of prayer and uh, you'll have to come back next week to hear the rest. God, we thank you so much for this day that you gave us. Challenge each and every one of us to be parents, to be mentors, to be young adults, to be people that in our own lives are cultivating biblical convictions, but are doing that in the lives of those children and young people around us. God, we know how important they are. We know how necessary they are, Lord, and we know how great temptations and difficulties they face. I pray that we as a church would make the decision to just bathe them in prayer, to take them under our wings, to guide them, to direct them, to lead them. Lord, you don't want to do great things with them in the future. You want to do great things with them now. I pray that that would be the desire of every person in here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.